Hey guys, it's Jolene from Smith's Nature Friendly Farms. We are hanging out in the garden today and we're going to talk about my soil results on the no-till garden for the last three years. So our journey to start a no-till garden started about four years ago. It was inspired by Charles Downing. He actually has his own YouTube channel and he is an amazing gardener. He's hugely successful with no-till and I'm pretty sure a big pioneer of why like so many people are starting to clue into the advantages of no-till gardening. Love his channel, highly recommend it, but he is what inspired me after watching some of his videos why I should consider no-till. It wasn't easy, it actually took a lot of time, and it wasn't the only type of garden we had. In our first years as a market garden, we actually tilled this entire field. This used to actually be completely full with green beans, and then we would also have a tilled garden down in here. So we did do a tilled garden for a couple of years and had that experience of a large garden with tilling. Really one for me was the no-till garden. It was always more successful. It wasn't always perfect. We learned a lot over each year, but it was definitely my favorite garden space and definitely produced way better results than our tilled garden. So I'm gonna go through the soil samples we've taken each year for the last three years, give you some insight into what's happening in my soil, and then I'll touch on some of the things along the way that I've really enjoyed with the no-till garden and what I've learned about the process. In this exact area when we moved in, this was just grass. This was a mowed area when we moved in. So we had to start with putting down plastic to kill off the grass. And then over the years, we started to build up areas of the soil. Now, during that time, we started to learn different things. Like you can see how wet it is over in here. We have some moisture that really comes in heavily over in this section down here. This area holds moisture really heavily. So these were things that we had to learn to work with and each season we kind of pick up, oh, well that doesn't work well and then we'd adjust. So that's why we went to kind of a more raised bed model. That's why we're adding mulch, um, all kinds of different things that changed our format. So a no-till garden, you really kind of, you, you, it's a build process. It doesn't happen overnight. You could essentially do a one-time till and then turn it into no-till but it still requires a ton of materials and good setup and a lot of that stuff just you don't have right off the bat like these materials the bark mulch lots of composted materials we've had to bring those in in truckloads uh, we, you will see that in some of our videos as we take you along but that kind of stuff you, you have to maybe acquire over time i had to work at quite a few farmers markets we saved up because this is this garden is funded by our farmers market for the most part so i try to keep it paid for by what we sell at the farmers market so i couldn't just come out of the gates and put in thousands of dollars of you know materials to instantly create the perfect no-till garden if you have that money fantastic no-till gardening will be much easier and quicker for you took me four years to get to what we have basically here and we're still improving in order for us to really learn about our soil and how to properly grow things here i started with soil samples and this is where you get your soil tested by a lab and it tells you what exactly is in your soil. So for us, the local extension office can do that. You can bring in a little baggie of soil, a couple of cups of soil, dry, uh, and you bring it in to their office and they test it. And it takes them a couple of weeks and you, you get a little letter back and tells you what is in your soil. So for the past three years, I've done that and I've looked at what our soil you know, contains. I highly recommend this because if you are adding stuff to your soil without knowing what's in it, you're making a mistake. You're, you're, you're either hurting your plants, hurting your ecosystem, or wasting your money. So make sure you get a soil sample and get in the habit of getting them. They're not very expensive. They're about $10. Now, this is American. If you're in Canada, I'm not sure where you get the soil samples from. I never knew this when I lived there. Uh, I believe you'd probably have to go to a private lab and it might not be cheap in Canada. I'm not too sure. But in the US, we do have the advantage that a lot of the extension offices will support you with that and it's not very expensive and so helpful. So let's talk about what's happening with my soil. They measure a lot of different things. There's like a big list. It's pH, phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, zinc, calcium, salt, lime, 
and I actually pay extra to have organic matter done. You used to be able to get nitrogen done, um, but they can't, they're not doing that anymore, but I also get organic matter done. So for the sake of this video, we're not gonna talk about the measurements of all of them. Um, I'm gonna talk about the key ones. So we're gonna talk about pH, I'm gonna talk about organic matter, we're gonna talk about uh, phosphorus and potassium. So we're gonna talk about those four and what I've seen in them in my garden. So let's start with the pH of the soil. pH is best between about 6 and 7. The ideal pH is 6.5. When we began this no-till journey, our soil test was 5.9 in our garden area. 5.9 is actually not bad, so that's a, not a, a horrible place to start out with. Then from there, we moved up to where our most recent one was, was actually 6.7. So we're slightly higher than the ideal 6.5, but we're still in a great growing range. If it grows too high though, it's not a good thing. You do wanna try and keep your range between that six and seven. The first year that we did our soil test, the year first year that we tilled in this field, the soil result was 5.5. So that's quite an acidic soil. We planted green beans and didn't add anything to the soil. And then the following year, we did another test after tilling and it was actually 5.3. So what I found interesting was how it actually degraded the soil through tilling and with absolutely no amendments. Whereas a no-till garden, the pH stayed in a fantastic range. Uh, not going to say that it won't still need to be somewhat managed, but it, it seems healthier in general. And production wise, that's my greatest result. Like I have the greater pr production out of this no-till garden. So when you look at those measurements, I'm confident that they are what is helping. It's the fact that we aren't tilling up the soil and all the life is existing underneath this soil that is feeding these plants. Now, why does pH matter? The pH influences the key nutrients available to the plants. So when it's in the right range, plants can take up the nutrients that they need. So it is really important to keep your pH in the right range. So I'm happy that we're maintaining between that six and seven, but I do have to watch in order to keep it in that range. So if it does, let's say it goes up to 7.1, and there's some arguments that out there that that 7.1 won't be harmful at all. But there's a lot of science out there that says that at 7.1, you start to degrade the plant's ability to take up the nutrients. So lowering it is adding uh, more manures to the soil, which we definitely do. We add sheep manure to the soil, thankfully to our neighbors, uh, or adding your nitrogens. So the next one is phosphorus. And our phosphorus has gone from 82 to 403 which is very very high <laughs> it's really high so that you would think maybe hey that's a good thing i don't have to add any phosphorus which is true i do not have to add any phosphorus but too much phosphorus actually can lead to other impacts maybe not particularly on your plants because your plants are actually only going to take up what they need but it actually can seep into your lakes and your streams and cause you problems to your ecosystem. It can cause excessive growth. So overall, it's not ideal. You don't want to be making more phosphorus. Um, and for me, this means I'm not adding any more phosphorus to the soil. So I'm not looking for um, even fertilizers that have phosphorus in them. I strictly, the only thing I need to add to my soil, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about it, but is nitrogen. Okay, so now on to potassium. And my potassium story is a lot like the phosphorus story. In fact, they're almost following the same pattern. So they, potassium was at around 300 and now it's up to 677, which is very high. So that's exactly how it's listed on the soil test, very high. Very similar story to the phosphorus, too much nutrients going on there and that needs to come down. So potassium increases the root growth and helps with drought resistance in the plants. It also aids in the food formation with it. But with too much of the potassium in your soil, it can't uptake the calcium and the nitrogen and the magnesium that's in the soil. So that's really important to the plant's health. Looking at your plants and they're starting to yellow, in some cases, this can actually be because you have too much potassium and it's not picking up the nutrients that it needs from the soil. Uh, it may not be getting enough zinc, for example. So in order to fix this, you have to amend the soil. And this means for me, this is again going back to the fact that I need to not add any more potassium to my soil. 
and I need to balance it out with more nitrogen. Okay, the next one is organic matter. And this one is interesting. I wasn't testing this and I didn't have this tested in some of my earliest test results. Uh, it wasn't even recommended to me to do organic matter, but it's actually one that I find probably the most interesting. I mean, it's all about balancing, so I can't really say one is more important than the other. Uh, organic matter needs to be in there just as much as nitrogen and potassium and all that. They all need to be balanced. That's the goal here. That's what makes this game kind of fun, I guess. But organic matter is all the fun stuff. It's the microorganism, the plant bits, the soil life. So to me, that's kind of the cool part. That's why I'm doing no-till gardening because I want to keep the organic matter, the life under the soil, super, super happy and all the little life living. Organic matter in Mississippi is typically around 2%. The goal for gardeners is around 3 to 6%. And that can vary depending on what university's results you see, but I think it's fairly common that 3 to 6% seems to be about right. When I did my first test, my organic material was 2.3%. In my most recent test, it was actually at 3.5%. So it's gone up and it's in a better value, better range in that 3 to 6 range that we're trying, what we're aiming for basically. So what I've learned from this is that it doesn't matter what method you're doing, whether you're tilling or whether you have a no-till garden, both systems need management. In the one method, in my tilled method, it looked like the soil was deteriorating. So I would have to manage that to bring the soil back up. And then in this no-till garden, I'm actually gardening in an accelerated way that was too rich uh, and was also working against me. So you really do have to focus on always trying to keep your garden area in that middle ground. And th with that, and the only way to determine that is really with your soil samples and knowing what you're working with. So in my case, I know that I have everything, every nutrients through the roof except for nitrogen. So my focus will be on just adding nitrogen and then monitoring and continuing to, to move forward with that. For those of you wondering how I'm going to balance off my nutrients in the soil, I'm gonna work on my nitrogen by adding blood meal to the soil and using a cover crop called Harry Vetch, uh, which is a nitrogen fixer. So we'll keep doing that. We've actually already used cover crops last season and we're using it again this season and hopefully that makes a difference in the soil. And the only way I'm going to be able to really measure it is if the other ones come down because nitrogen isn't measured in our soil test. So I won't actually know, you know what it's at. Plus it's always depleting. So I might be in a, in a bit of a method of constantly adding it. I feel like by continuing to maintain this quality of soil with compost and all that, that I'm probably always going to be in the position of just adding nitrogen and not needing to add the other elements. But, you know, I'm going to do a soil test to tell me for sure I won't make that assumption. But that's my guess. That's my theory. Awesome, you guys. Well, hopefully you found that interesting. It, was, it has been interesting for me as I look at my soil test throughout the years. If you have any questions or you have any insights by no means am i a science expert if you know this this stuff is new to me but if you have any expertise or any comments or questions put them down in the comments below be friendly be kind